Good morning. This is Steve Stites, Chief Medical Officer here at the... Oh, my God, the picture they just put up. Oh, my God. <laughs> mm. Steve Stites, yeah. Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you, fortunately with distance and without a telephone, from the Dolph Simons Family Studio. Yes, I knew I should have been prepared for that photograph, but it came up, and I just couldn't stop from laughing, because in that picture, we were violating almost every single rule of infection control right there. You and I don't hand hygiene. Coffee. Okay, I do have hand hygiene. And look, 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 there's Anthony trying to come over and get me to fix my mic, which he spent an entire year trying to get me yeah. to do right. <laughs> oh, Anthony looks boy. young and spry there. You know what this is? You know what this is? This is March 19th, 2020. Look at you laughing at me. Everybody laughs at me. Uh, and today is March 19th, 2021. This is our official one-year anniversary of this broadcast, and we are so happy that you're with us for this, this program. And we're happy that you've been standing by us all this time, asking great questions, and hopefully listening and learning of things around vaccination. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hawkeye, how are we doing this morning? We're doing good. You know, I think we are in a race with um, Hayes to have the, the, the quickest to zero for acute, oh, man. acute infections. We know that in New York, even um, in these past six months, there was a hospital or two that had no acute infections there at, at some point in time. Uh, but our numbers are, are continuing to be good. We were a little bit worried there. It looked like they were creeping up. Today we have eight active infections with three in the ICU, one on a ventilator, and good. 15 in that recovery period. That's so, getting low, 23. I like yep. it. And Hayes only has two, and those are two acute infections on that recovery All right. Period, so. those are, that's great numbers. So, of course, Mm-hmm. Joined, of course, by Dana Hawkinson, our medical director of infection prevention and control, and Amanda. Good, welcome back, Amanda Cackler. How are you doing this morning? Doing well. Amanda is our director of quality and safety, and we're all a year older today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe we've only aged one year, maybe a little bit more. Mm -hmm. So this is our morning to answer your questions. But before we go there, let's first see if there are reporter questions. I think Jill's out there with those reporters. Hey, good morning. morning. Oh, mo- sorry, Cody. Jill. Go ahead. Hey, yeah. Cody. Hey, guys. Hey, happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you, and thanks for being with us. Yeah. Hey, no problem. Um, as we get into a year from you know from where we started, uh, I wondered your thoughts on Missouri opening up for all adults by four nine. That seemed to be by April 9th. That he seemed to be huge news. Uh, and Kansas moving ahead with phases three and four next week. Uh, just your your overall thoughts on that. I think it is all great news, mm-hmm. and I think it just reflects the fact there's a whole lot of vaccine that's going to be coming into play. And as that happens, we're all going to get safer. Mm-hmm. And that is, I, I agree with you, Cody, that's great news. I'm delighted on the April 9th date. I, you know, if I could speculate, I bet Kansas won't be too different. I think we're going to get through phase three and four, and pretty soon it's going to be we're just opening it up because we have so much more vaccine. Mm-hmm. Team, what do you think, Hawk? I think the vaccinations are important. I, I believe in England they have shown a significant improvement in their rate of spread of the infection because of their vaccinations. Yeah. They're doing a, a little bit different than we are, uh, but I believe Israel has had a significant uh, improvement. Yeah, too they've really spread. shown a lot of great data, Amanda. Yeah, Ross. I think the critical element of that is the availability. So mm-hmm. now that we've got more vaccine available, let's just get vaccines in arms. And is there a more perfect microcosm of what it means than the University of Kansas Hospital? How many people are out these days with COVID now since we've got our employees 85% vaccinated? Yeah, I I feel like yesterday we talked about the rolling number being zero, Mm -hmm. which is incredible. That is incredible. And at one point we were per day acute COVID. In the teens and 20s. 20s. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if we've fallen 100% to zero, and if that's what the country can do, if we can achieve uh, 85% of people being vaccinated, you know what? Let's go Royals, here I come. (laughs) I do think um, a a key point of that is that uh, when you're vaccinated, you may or may not be showing the symptoms. So what does that impact on testing? And is is COVID still out there and we're just not feeling the impact of it because we're not symptomatic? Yeah, I think the ultimate test of that and the ultimate um, uh, benchmark of that is going to be the hospitalizations Mm -hmm. and deaths, because just for the point that you said exactly. And even if COVID is still out there, which I think it's going to be out there. I think COVID's here for Mm -hmm. a long time. I think it's going to act like influenza, but we want it to act like influenza and not like SARS-CoV-2, because then it won't have quite the same level of death and tragedy associated with it. Which um, I was looking at the COVID deaths in-house today, and we haven't had an inpatient death in over um, six days, which that stretch so is, is, is great because we were seeing them every single day. So yeah, that we is were. a positive sign. Yeah, yeah. And mm-hmm. I think it's because we have fewer COVID patients, mm-hmm. and I think we're just we're doing better with tra- treatment, too. Cody, other questions? Yeah, just one more for me. Uh, CDC is expected, uh, I believe, today to come out with new guidance on schools. Um, I'm curious 
what you've heard on that. Dr. Anthony Fauci also said during a briefing yesterday that that change, it's expected to go, I believe, from six feet to three feet, mm -hmm. could also have an impact mm -hmm. on general social distancing. Yeah. And, you know, you've, you've drilled this into us six feet for, you know, 365 days now. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on uh, the overall changes in that regard. Yeah, you bet. So the World Health Organization yeah. has been at three feet for a long time. Yeah. So the CDC will be making, I think I'm with you, I think they're going to be making the change around three feet. You know, it's what we've said. You're building the airplane while you fly it. Mm -hmm. And I think what Fauci is trying to recognize is that is six feet safer? You bet. Is there an economic reality we have to face to keep our, keep our country open and keep people employed and having an income? I think that's true, too. And I think, Hawk, mm -hmm. I'll turn to you first, mm -hmm. but you, let's both comment. Um, uh, three feet is probably okay. Mm -hmm. Six feet makes me even feel better because mm -hmm. I know the dynamic of it. And when we've been yeah. in the freezer before, we watch how yeah. far our particles go, uh, our breath cloud goes. But I, I, I get what he's trying to do here. Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back to the true, true un unrelated issues. We know that the World Health Organization, since the beginning, has said three feet. The CDC has said six feet. Why? Because the World Health Organization does have to cater to the world where it it is more difficult to maybe spread out six feet in some of those countries and some of those uh, communities. Um, but we also have to remember it's not in a vacuum of three feet. I believe it's still in the context of, number one, vaccinations, masking, and things of that nature. So that will help. And it's also in light of the data that shows there is a small percentage of um, transmission of the virus in the schools when you are doing those other things such as masking as well and of course vaccination will help also. Yeah, I think the context of the activities being performed is also incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, if you're not doing anything of high risk, three feet is probably fine. If you're doing something um, more high risk, um, the, the uh, further distance the better. And I we have good that. evidence if we kind of go back to one of those seminal papers about transmission uh, and masking with the hairdressers mm -hmm. in uh, in Springfield and of the you know of the 114 patients uh, clients that they were able to interview afterward they didn't find any transmission uh, in those patients from two hairdressers that had it. So We know masking works Amanda. How many of our employees have gotten sick while taking care of COVID patients? We have had not <laughs> I mean, masking works. The evidence is incontrovertible, and I know that there are still some people out there who want to say that it's not true. You're just wrong. I'm sorry. It's just wrong. The evidence is incontrovertible. If we don't spread it in a hospital, when we had 125 positive COVID patients and a bunch of folks in recovery, if we didn't spread it to our employees then because we all wore masks, you know what? Masking works. That's right. Yeah. So, other questions? Chill. I'm muted. I, I found the mute button. Oh, you know what, Jill? I've been trying to find that for you for like a year. Mm -hmm. Just kidding, of course. <laughs> uh, but we're all enjoying okay, that I'm joke. Gonna start, I'm, gonna start with, I'm gonna start with a really hard question then, just for that. Okay. Uh, Bob, wants, Bob wants to know, um, and you mentioned the Royals, so I think that may be the inspiration. But uh, last year at the beginning of the pandemic, you used to tell us we were only in the bottom of the first inning to give us some perspective of how long a battle we had. What inning do you think we're in today? Oh, that is a great question. You know, I think about that. Um, oh, I'd like to say we're in extra innings because it's been so long. Yeah. And I would have said, if you'd asked me that question last year, if you'd asked me what inning we would have been in by now, I would have said, hey, the game's over. But with a year in, I, you know, I'm going to say we're in the fifth or sixth inning. And I think because we've lived a lot and we've learned a lot, the variants are concerning. we got to get everybody vaccinated, and then we got to figure out how we manage the chronicity of a little bit of COVID out there. And once we've got that figured out, the game will be over. And I think, uh, but right now, I'd say we're in the fifth or sixth inning. we still got a few more innings to play. But what I'm hoping for is vaccina vaccination equals HDH. He remembers that. Come on, Herrera, Herrera, Davis, yeah, yeah, in Holland, right? We're the closers. We're going to shut it down. That's what vaccine is going to be. Closers for the Kansas City Royals. We'll shut it down, and then the game will be over. That's my answer. Thoughts? I think one uh, big factor that we still have some time that we have to anticipate is the, the pediatric yeah. or the kids getting vaccinations and what, what that's going to look like, and we don't have that information yet. So yep, yep. there is still some 
distance we have to Great go. point. And, and Moderna starting their trial on young, and even down to, was it six months or two months? Uh, I don't remember. It's yeah. very young. Yeah. I mean, I'll say middle of the third. Middle of the third inning? <laughs> I mean, we got a okay, long way to go. Can we mute his mic? Can we mute his mic, please? We got go to get the, vaccina- the vaccine companies to uh, pivot and create some of these um, vaccines against the variants. You know, possible uh, multi-strain or multi-variant vaccines. We know we've done that with other vaccines, putting, especially for influenza, which is a good example. We have four different strains in that vaccine. So, um, but hopefully the next few innings will move by quicker and be much nicer. That's the new (laughs) vaccine right there, people. All right, Jill, next question. Yeah, we have two or three, and I know you have a a hard stop today, so we'll rock right through these. I I wanna ask, um, this person said I had my first Moderna on February 3rd, four days later, came down with bronchitis and walking pneumonia, lots of meds and just tapering off steroids. I missed my second dose, now what are my options? Oh, that's a great question. I'm not sure that the vaccine causes bronchitis and, 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 and pneumonia and things like that, Hawkeye. I wonder if there are a couple things going on, but yeah. I don't think you want to miss your second dose. No, I would. Um, I, I need to see that medical record and details of what exactly was diagnosed and how. But uh, if you missed your second dose, go get your second dose. Uh, again, uh, the, the guidance is that you can uh, get the vaccine four days either side of your scheduled dose. But if you do miss your scheduled dose, uh, go ahead and get that. And there is no catch-up dosing. You don't have to restart the, the vaccination series. So go ahead and get it, schedule that, and get that second dose. All right. Another question, I had the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Next day, I had chills and nausea, and now I have no voice. Is that normal? Um, I've not heard about the no voice. The other part of Amanda is all pretty normal. Yeah, those are pretty Mm -hmm. um, common symptoms Mm -hmm. that we've seen with all of the vaccines. Um, The no voice I haven't seen as a specific symptom, but um, it's not anything that I would be concerned about, the effectiveness or anything of the vaccine. Yeah, no, I would agree. it could just be that a few days earlier you're also infected with another virus. Maybe you got some laryngitis or something of that nature. But and you know, I would just say since we don't know all the vaccine, all the, the side effects, it, it yeah. could easily be possible. Mm-hmm. But as long as you're getting better, I wouldn't be concerned about it. Your voice mm-hmm. going to come back, and and um, you know these things. Again, we're injecting you with the protein or something mm-hmm. that make you start building a re- your an immune response to the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2. So. That's an, you're going to have an immune reaction, and that can manifest itself in different ways, and mm-hmm. it just as if you had gotten the infection. So don't be surprised if you have symptoms like a little bit of uh, what's been described here, and I think that could even include uh, hoarseness. So I'm not concerned at all. Uh, I, I, my bet is it's all going to go away shortly. Yeah, remember the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is an adenovirus vector, but when it is injected into you, it does not replicate in your body, so it, it's not creating more viruses. The only thing you're really getting is uh, the spike protein out of that. Okay, two more and then we'll, we'll rock, start rocking through our other questions. Um, do we know if any of our patients that are admitted right now have been vaccinated? You know, that we kind of, we kind of prepared for that. And we think the, the answer is no, but we're not for certain. Yeah, we haven't built that into our medical record yet, so we can't quickly identify that information. I know we've had patients who've had their first vaccine, mm-hmm. and they had requested their second vaccine, but at the time mm-hmm. that they were here, we weren't uh, we weren't able to provide that. I think moving yeah. forward, that'll be something that we'll be able to take uh, into consideration. And I know we're working on how do we get that question assessed upon admission. Yeah, and I would feel, and I, I've certainly seen a patient in the hospital who got their first vaccine, but was in the hospital so they could get their second they were in the hospital for a completely other reason not covid but i would assume that a lot of patients would offer that information to us oh by the way i did get my first mm-hmm. or my second dose yeah we well. certainly not heard it i'm going to yeah. bet that the answer is no but i don't know that for certain yet yeah. so right and then uh one more question and then we'll start on our list uh do we know if the vaccines all of them or any of them will help prevent long haul situations Oh, that's a great mm-hmm. question. That's a great question. And I'm going to say that because the yeah. patients who get COVID with this are often asymptomatic or have very few symptoms, I'm going to bet the answer will be yes. Mm-hmm. But long haul, there appears to be several forms of it, Hawk, and some people mm-hmm. have mild or no symptoms mm-hmm. and then develop some yeah. long haul things three to six months later. Yeah. There's also some discussion that maybe the vaccine helps treat long haul yeah. syndrome. So help us out with this question. Yeah, no, that's weird. Uh, for the first part is um, certainly we would hope and assume that 
because you're not having as critical disease or severe disease or severe symptoms, that it would help prevent the long haul uh, symptoms later on as well. And there are news reports, and I know it's being investigated fully, uh, you know, what that mechanism would be, but people who do seem to have long haul symptoms um, seem to have an improvement in those or resolution of those symptoms after the vaccine dose. So that's, that's an interesting thing, and I know that's being studied right now. Okay, question number one. If the Johnson & Johnson vaccine ends up getting being better with two doses, should people who only got one consider that a setback? You know, I, I think that, again, we're building the airplane while we fly it, and we always learn more. So I would never consider it a setback. First of all, you can always go get your second dose, because I think the interval in the study is three months, and we're mm -hmm. only starting to do Johnson & Johnson now, and we'll get yeah. the data in July. So four or five months, that's not a setback. You can go get the second mm -hmm. dose. I would not be concerned mm -hmm. about that. Second of all, the vaccine data coming out with Johnson & Johnson is that it's completely protective against being hospitalized or death. So what you're really, so I think, I, I think what we're going to find out, because there are also ongoing trials with Moderna and Pfizer, I think we're going to find that they have about the same level of single dose effectiveness. Everything will be more effective with two doses, but you get really good efficacy with one dose from all the vaccines. I bet that's where we land. Yeah, and there's information talk. out there even that if you had COVID and then got a first dose of, I believe it was the Pfizer uh, that was published, you have higher antibody levels um, than if you just had um, the infection by itself. So that almost that first dose almost acts like a boosting dose as well. Now again, this guidance is still because those studies were done with two doses, uh, mostly for to obtain durability um, and a full protective immunity. But there are being there are studies being done with one dose, and you know that is how England or Britain has gone through their dosing schedule to try and get as many vaccines into arms as possible. They've kind of just elected to go with as many first doses as possible and then come back and get your second dose later. Yeah, one dose is better than no dose. Yeah. yeah. I heard you say studies suggest the possibility of infecting others with the virus when vaccinate, vaccinated is growing more remote, but is it also true with the variants? Team, I think we just don't have enough information around this question yet. Mm -hmm. The closest would be some of the South African data mm -hmm. on the J&J, &J, which tend to look pretty darn good. But I still think, I don't think we know enough. We don't know. Yeah. Mostly the variant um, information, especially with J&J, &J, is, uh, is surrounding hospitalization and death, which it does look to have um, continued efficacy, although not as high from these kind of original Wuhan variant issues, but um, we hope and we're extrapolating from the real world Israeli data and from some of this other Johnson & Johnson uh, FDA brief data that overall it should help reduce, uh, but we just don't know with the variants. Um, so that is what we are going to be, to be learning and I think England is going to be a good um, real world experience with that because of the prevalence of that UK variant, uh, but we're just kind of waiting and seeing that. Is it okay to grow my bubble and be unmasked with others if everyone is fully vaccinated? Any limits to the size of those gatherings? You know, this is a great question. Mm -hmm. I'll turn to Amanda first. And I think I think this is going to be another of those, we're building the airplane while we fly mm -hmm. at things, and we've learned a lot more about SARS-CoV-2. Now we're learning about the situation that can occur after vaccination. I'm probably more comfortable, but am I comfortable? Right. I think mm -hmm. there are a couple of things to take into consideration, and that is, um, are all of the household members of the people that you're including in your bubble also vaccinated? Um, and I think we need to be really cautious still not to extend, even if you're in a group of five or six or seven who are all vaccinated, um, we know that you can, or the CDC guidance is that you are able to interact without masks, mm -hmm. um, as long as you're not in the healthcare setting. That was very specific in that in that vaccination guidance. Um, but I think you have to take into consideration who are they going home to and are they vaccinated and what are the potential risks there? Again, what are the activities that you're participating in? Are you just um, having conversations? Are you um, singing together or eating together or, or those kinds of things? So I think I'm more comfortable, but I don't know that I feel comfortable. Com yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's where I am. What do you think, Hawk? Yeah, I mean, I think we're, we're getting there, but you have to make sure, um, just as Amanda said, you know, is everybody in that household that you're meeting with vaccinated? So it's not just the adults going out and meeting with vaccinated adults. I think that's the important thing to remember. And what size, uh, you know, I don't know, 10 is an arbitrary number that's been said since the beginning. What's the difference really between five and 10? Well, then what's the difference between 12 and 15? Um, 
I think we're still kind of trying to understand all of that. Yeah, we're early into this. Mm -hmm. I think we feel more comfortable. I don't know that we feel comfortable. I think you, the point you've made about who are you going to, if you were to get the virus, who are you going to take it home to mm -hmm. or to, and how sick could they be and how you feel about that? That's the question you have to really answer. And I'd say if you're going to go into a home with people you oh, haven't been around a lot and you're not sure about their behaviors or where they've been coming from, even if vaccinated, it, we think you can still spread the virus. I'd say still wear a mask, maybe take it off for dinner, try to be a part. And in the next few months, we'll have a really a lot more information about yeah. this question. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many permutations to this, but we also do understand, like we alluded to in the first question, uh, one of the, the first questions about um, there's more signal that the vaccines do prevent um, asymptomatic disease uh, to a good extent right now. And if that is, then we are extrapolating saying, well, then you probably are uh, have less transmission because you have less viral replication. The other thing is, um, say, for instance, in your households, if all the adults are vaccinated because uh, they are healthcare workers or essential workers are in those phases and we're able to get it, but the children are not, but the people surrounding that family, um, the support givers like uh, grandparents and things, maybe they've been vaccinated as well. So that, that's something to consider also. Those most vulnerable populations, maybe they've been vaccinated at this point. Um, that's just other, other details to consider. Jill. All right. Once my parents and I are fully vaccinated, can I safely give them a good <laughs> long hug? They are in their 80s. One has COPD and the other has cancer. You Master know, ma unmasked too. That, uh, that's a great question. I, first of all, it's always safer if you do it with a, with a mask on. But I'm feeling better about the good long hug if everybody's vaccinated. What do you think, Hawk? Yeah, I think so. I think um, in this situation, yeah, I do. Yeah, I think um, we've talked about hugs before. And I know. I'm the hugger, people. I am it's a hugger. It's good to give hugs. We've just determined yeah. that hugs are safe, yep. um, and especially if all, all parties are um, are vaccinated. Yeah. I think, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I do, too. Just be careful doing that at work. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh, okay, this is a medical show. We're staying in our lane, people. <laughs> Although, that was pretty funny. It was. I heard steroids and medications that treat compromised immune systems make the shots less effective. Is that true? Should I stop taking them until fully vaccinated? Oh, don't stop those things if you've got an autoimmune disease or some process that the steroids and things are helping you control because you don't want to get sick from that. Hawkeye, what do you think? I think depending on how, what your level yeah. of immunosuppression is, we're still seeing that even transplant patients yep. can get some immunity from vaccination. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think that's a good question. I think it all depends on the level of immunosuppression. We know that even if you are some of those highly immunosuppressed patients with uh, solid organ transplant or bone marrow transplant, um, there are regimens and, and time frames in which you can get your vaccine after those transplants occur. So I think it's important to understand that we do expect that there is some uh, reduction in the immune response, uh, but we don't know fully what that is. And if somebody is prescribing you steroids or other immunosuppression, certainly speak with them. There is some uh, data coming out now. There was a report about transplant patients receiving their vaccines. Uh, but again, these are highly suppressed patients on different medications. So certainly talk with your provider. Um, but overall, you are still probably, we're going to give you the vaccine just because the benefit outweighs the risk. Yeah, don't stop your regular medications, right. get your vaccine. Yeah, don't yeah, stop your regular medications. If medication. you're on, you know, just a dose of prednisone or something of that nature, one, maybe two drugs, you're still probably going to amount to immune response as well. So. Yeah, and I mean, transplant patients are often a drug called Prograf, another one called yep. Celsef, and 10 or 20 milligrams a day of prednisone, yeah. and they can still get some recovery or some mm -hmm. uh, important uh, results from vaccination. So get vaccinated. Okay. All right, I'm going to squeeze this one in from Pat because it's kind of along the same theme. His son had brain cancer four years ago, and he's on seizure medication. We have a lot of people asking about seizure medication and getting the vaccine. Is it safe? I think it's safe, yeah. Hawks. Yeah. Okay, Amanda? Yeah, I uh, haven't seen anything to suggest otherwise. Yep. Let's go. Get it. Get the vaccination. All right, next question. If I've not had any side effects from the second dose of Pfizer or Moderna, does that mean my shot failed? Shouldn't I feel something? What do you think, Amanda? Has the shot failed? It absolutely has not failed. Um, we have seen such a variance in people's response to first and second doses, but it doesn't mean anything about the effectiveness of the vaccine itself. It's just everyone's response is a little different. 
I, that's how I look at it. I think it's, it's, it's absolutely the right thing to do. You're still going to get vaccinated. You're still going to get a response. Some people are like that with influenza vaccine. Mm -hmm. Some people are like that with the shingles <laughs> vaccine. You know, I barely had a side effect from the shingles vaccine. I had a terrible time with the, mm -hmm. with, uh, the Moderna second dose. Not terrible. I just got ch chills and fevers for a day. But uh, it, it can happen. But you still are going to offer. You're still going to get that immunity, Hawkeye. Yeah, I agree. There's no recommendation to you know check antibody levels or anything like that. And again, there's no commercially available uh, T cell immune assay either. So you know, get that vaccine. There is no correlate of protection or no correlation of having bad symptoms after the vaccine doses and having no symptoms after the doses and having protection or not. Is anyone in the Metro doing genomic sequencing to spot more infectious virus variants? You know, I know that KDHE is doing mm -hmm. random sampling throughout mm -hmm. the state and Missouri is doing the same, looking for this. And so I don't know that anybody else in the metro is doing it. They're looking at it both in wastewater mm -hmm. and with some of the tests that come to their lab. Yeah, I don't think that um, the availability of the test, the tools to do that mm -hmm. are um, beyond KDHE at this point in the state of Kansas. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I we have the ability to send any um, specific isolates of patients if we think they have been infected before and now are coming back in with a reinfection. We have that ability to send to the state. Uh, but just as you said, and, and Secretary Norman has said, they're, they're looking. Yeah, um, and we look. And we sent some out mm -hmm. in, because we were a little thought, well, that's a little bit of an odd sign. Let's go ahead and send it just to be sure. But um, So you can absolutely ask the state to do it, mm -hmm. but there, I don't know of anybody else specifically doing this testing Widespread right now. Widespread surveillance. Yeah. There are some, you have to actually have some research equipment that actually we you, you could do in the city. I think hospitals could work with um, um, some different places in the city mm -hmm. if we really wanted yeah. to. But the state's offering it, so I don't know if there's another I think there's enough labs around the city to be able to do it if we needed to. Yeah. But, yeah. All right. Next question. Do the current vaccines protect against the South Africa, African and Brazilian variants enough to keep one out of the hospital? Mm -hmm. And what's the big deal with those, including the UK? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Hawkeye, I think the answer to this question is not completely known, yeah. but it looks like the J&J da data in South Africa demonstrated mm -hmm. that it did keep people out of the hospital. Yeah, uh, we do have um, kind of real-world trial data with, uh, just as you said, the J&J the &J vaccine, and it did have efficacy, I think it was 65 or 70 percent against severe disease and death, which is really good. That was 82 percent. Maybe Could I'm wrong. All the numbers I hope get I'm right. They, but, get, they get mixed you know, up. I think there still is good efficacy there. Yep. We do have new, uh, I think just this week, there were two published articles, correspondence in New England Journal of Medicine, both about Moderna and Pfizer, but these were lab studies. So these were looking at just at neutralizing antibody levels against um, UK and South Africa. And they still, although had reduced antibody levels, did have fairly good uh, levels of antibody against those two isolates. And what are the big deals with them? Um, there's certain mutations, there's about a, probably a, a 20 or 30 amino acid stretch in that area of the spike that binds to our receptor. And within that, when you have uh, mutations or amino acid substitutions, which just changes how that receptor uh, or that binding domain looks, that is what will block new antibodies that are created by the vaccine. So um, sp specifically for the South Africa, uh, the number that you're going to hear is 484. There's an amino acid substitution at that position in the spike protein, and that what is what um, helps reduce the efficiency of the vaccines. So. Yeah, I have nothing to add. Yeah, I don't have anything to add on either. They well, asked. I do, I this, mean, it does a great, the, it's a great, you gave a great and very, very well-informed answer. And just to say, that's the second set of animal and lab data that's demonstrated the same thing about Moderna yeah. and Pfizer vaccine against yep. the South African UK variant that's been published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And there's a correspondence about a month ago that kind of said the yeah. same thing as I recall. So I think that's really good news. It is, what it says to us mm -hmm. is that it is going to work. And I, so I think we're pretty comfortable with that. The second thing I would just point out is that as you look across the country, there are variants. These variants are already in the United States, yeah. but they've not taken off like they yeah. had in other countries. So now they are, they are starting to in some areas, just to be fair. But I, I think part of what we're seeing is that we have had some success, especially in nursing home vaccinations, where so many people are vaccinated and we're not seeing a spike in nursing home admissions. Yeah, yeah I mean, just to your point, too, you know, the California uh, variants, uh, that is another amino acid substitution in that range that I talked about that just changes the way the spike looks. Um, 
So uh, we are kind of waiting for all of that information. And remember, on the spike protein itself, um, either from the J&J &J vaccine or the Moderna Pfizer vaccines, there's about 20 epitopes or 20 regions that we really look to make immune responses against, both with antibodies and T cells as well. All right, Jill. Yeah, um, one more printed question and just two uh, real quick things. I'm watching the clock. Caprell, I hope I'm saying your name right. She just wants to say um, thank you because mm -hmm. she had so much anxiety with this COVID uh, going out in public until she started watching your show. And she just appreciates all that the panels panelists do to keep them safe. She said her anxiety level went down a lot. So a big thank you. Well, thank Lori you, said, Lori said that North Kansas City Schools last night sent the parents notice that they're going to let the kids play in the playground without masks. And but they said it's the parents option. She says, should I keep my fifth grader mask for now or let them go? What do you think, Amanda? I think I would recommend wearing a mask. I would too. I wouldn't hesitate. So wear a mask. There's a lot lower numbers, but let's see how we do when schools are open, bars are opening up, restaurants are opening up, more people are getting vaccinated. Let's just wait a little longer, especially if your child is going to come home to a place where people haven't been vaccinated or they're, they're going to have you know sick parents or sick grand or anybody, if they're going to be around other people that are going to be ill that they could potentially make very sick with, the, with COVID-19. So I think the risk is not to the kid, so, the child so much, but really the risk is to the home environment or whatever bubble that child travels in. I think that should help guide your decision. I'd wear a mask. Tammy wants to know if you have any concerns about uh, the big box stores, the pharmacies, groceries, handling the vaccine according to storage thaw and administration. Well, I don't. They handle medicines all the time, Hawkeye. Huh? Yeah. No, I mean, they've been giving vaccines um, for, for a long time. So, yeah. and I think, again, Johnson & Johnson makes that a lot easier to do. But I don't have a concern. You know, pharmacies no. handle medications all the time. They're yeah. experts at it, That's so I think exactly they're very right. good. They're still professionals. They know they know what they're doing. Yep. Makes it easier for the community to access it. And the last question of the day is a popular one. Allergy season seems early. If I had a cough, a runny nose, or a cold, symptoms, can I still go get my shot? So, yeah, you can still get your shot. I would almost wonder if it's necessary for you to also get your, your uh, test done. Yeah. Yeah, get your COVID check before you get the shot. <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, get to a, uh, a PCR antigen test if you're having symptoms. If that's negative, then go ahead and get it. We give um, vaccines regularly to patients in the hospital. Uh, obviously not COVID because we aren't giving those to our hospitalized patients. But patients who are in the hospital and ill for other reasons. I think as long as you are 24 hours out or more from a fever, I think you're okay to go ahead and get those vaccines. You know, just to say, the other remarkable thing about this point around masking, I'm going to make it again because it is incontrovertible. The, um, we do these respiratory viral panels a lot in the hospital where there's a set mm -hmm. of like 22 viruses we check for. It includes coronavirus, now not SARS-CoV-2, yeah. but coronavirus in general. And um, in my population, assisting fibrosis patients is a pretty routine test. And so I am not seeing positive RVPs. Mm -hmm. You know what? I'm just not seeing coronavirus on those tests. And coronavirus kind of acts like coronavirus, and it responds to masking because we've known that in the hospital. So I think even the lack of influenza, the lack of RSV, mm -hmm. the lack of other coronaviruses, the lack of all these viral illnesses coming in and people being tipped over from their COPD or their asthma or their heart failure, chronic disease by these viruses, the lack of seeing that is testimony. Yeah. to the effectiveness of masking. Well, I think to your point, um, to the bone marrow transplant patients I see, which again, are probably some of the most immune suppressed patients you will ever see. They have absolutely no white blood cell counts to fight off infection. Your colleagues happily perform bronchoscopy. So they go down and look at the lung, uh, wash out the lung. We haven't found really um, many other viral infections, even going down looking in the lung for people who have known lung infections. So I think that's just um, continued, yeah, testimony and support. And I don't think that it's realistic, but I think it's an extremely important infection prevention pillar. Um, mm -hmm. Wearing the masking really does prevent the spread of transmission of yeah. really everything. Everything. Um, and it, it, supporting good hand hygiene in the in the playground setting. I mean, you're touching a lot of surfaces, not specific to prevent COVID-19, but other mm -hmm. organisms that are running around on surfaces. So I don't know how realistic it is <laughs> to have kids running around with uh, hand sanitizer or to wear masks forever. I'm not suggesting that, but it, it is good preventative practices that we've known about for years. 
Hey, Monday, we will update COVID-19 vaccine and outpatient therapeutic trials. There are opportunities for enrollment. Doctors uh, need your participation. Well, we need the participation of doctors, but we need the participation of everybody in the trial. Dr. Mario Castro, the Vice Chair of Clinical and Translational Research here at KU, and Dr. Barbara Pahood at, from Children's Mercy Hospital, one of their heads of research and, and a person who's been intimately involved with uh, vaccination development across the country. Uh, they'll be back to answer questions about vaccine uh, trials for adults and for kids. So that'll be a great program. We'll get a really good update from these two terrific folks on Monday. Final thoughts, team. It's been a year. Yeah, it's been a year. Um, last year we didn't get the luxury of having a basketball tournament, mm -hmm. so I'm really excited for this um, today kicking off the Sure, you asked yesterday. me if I filled out my bracket. <laughs> Brackets are due yet. at noon, so make sure you get those filled out and go Jayhawks. Uh, I think before noon. Isn't 11-15 the first game? Um, well, Chief the yeah, first the Jayhawks day. got robbed last year, <laughs> so... Um, too bad we can't go to that. I was waiting uh, until I know the final updates on any teams that test positive, so I'll fill mine out here just after this. But, um, you know, we're going to be learning more and more information about the variants. We know that um, England has seen a reduction in cases since being able to get out uh, vaccines into arms, jabs as they call it. Um, so hopefully that will continue here and we can continue to enroll people in our vaccinations and all the local health departments and other facilities that are giving vaccinations. Go out and get your vaccines. They are safe. They are effective. And this is the way we can stop the spread. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear MMU. Happy birthday to mm. you. You know what? And happy birthday to all of us for having survived this year from COVID-19. And uh, let's keep it going, right? Because we know that the rules of infection, prevention, and control travel with us wherever we go. Wash your hands. Wear your masks. Keep your distance. Don't go out if you're sick. Cough into your elbow. Take care of each other. And if we do that and we all get vaccinated... We'll be the 2015 Royals bullpen. We will shut COVID down. We'll see you on Monday.